Hello and welcome to Stay Paid, the sales and marketing podcast from Reminder Media on a mission to help you close more deals and retain more business so you can live a life of freedom tomorrow, but only if you take action today. My name is Joshua Stike. And I'm Luke Acri. And it is great to be here. <laughs> I will say this. We gotta get you out of the financial yes, department. Yes, everybody man. knows so I'm, I'm going through the point in our company where I'm back in the finance department and we're kind of reorganizing, restructuring. And, and for anybody who knows me, knows I'm a sales and marketing guy. And I don't know if you want a sales and marketing guy in your, your finance department. I have an engineering background. I mean, I was computer science, but... That's the last time I looked at numbers, I think. All so. I know is we're trying to get some new office space put together for our marketing and, and uh, an operations team and everything. And every time we put a new proposal in front of Luke lately, it's what else can we get rid of? Yeah, yeah. Can what we else take can we shave down, off? Yeah, can we take apart that cubicle? <laughs> can we get it down to bare bones to get it cheaper? But <laughs> that's what it is we'll about being there, an man. entrepreneur. You got to be willing to go anywhere, anytime. That's it. And then obviously learn how to delegate and scale. Yes. So I don't want to be in finance forever. If I'm in finance a year from now, you guys know we got major problems. <laughs> well, speaking of being an entrepreneur, our guest today is not only an entrepreneur, he's also a marketing strategist and a business consultant, but that's only scratching the surface. His name is Perry Marshall, and he is responsible for reinventing the use of the 80-20 principle and is the author mm. of multiple books, including the world's best-selling book on internet advertising, Ultimate Guide to Google AdWords. He also wrote Ultimate Guide to Facebook Advertising and 80-20 Sales and Marketing. Coolest thing about that, I think, is he really has some very tangible ideas on how to take our preconception mm -hmm. of what the 80-20 rule is, and that's what we'll get into in this podcast, and really kind of directly apply it to business strategy today, all about taking action on what makes dollars and cents. He's been endorsed in Forbes and Inc. Magazine and has clients in over 300 different industries. Super excited to have him on the podcast and pick his brain for how our service-based sales listeners can apply these ideas to their business. Perry Marshall, welcome to the podcast. Great to be here. Thanks for having me on your show. It's an honor. Yeah, Perry, it really is awesome to have you. In fact, you know, I, I feel kind of ashamed because I'm a marketing guy, but I didn't when you first you know, came uh, about where we, we could have you on the podcast. I was like, who is Perry Marshall? I don't know who Perry Marshall is. So shame on me, because when I looked into your stuff, I'm like, oh, my goodness, you're our wealth of knowledge. So I'm looking forward to getting into kind of the details and what has led you on this journey. Uh, you know, we always start the interviews asking if you will introduce yourself to our audience, just kind of give the Cliff Notes version of your life? Why, you know, are you passionate about marketing? What has led you on this journey? So just take a few moments and introduce yourself and your story to our audience. So I uh, live in Chicago. I'm turning 50 in a couple months and uh, I've got a wife and six kids. Six four kids. Standard wow. issue, four <laughs> standard issue and two adopted from nice. China. That's awesome. And, um, and so um, our house is like a sitcom. Like all you have to do is sit in the living room and sometime in the next 10 minutes, the door will blow open and some <laughs> dramatic <laughs> person will come in and mix everything up. And it could be wife, kids, neighbor, neighbor, kids. We, we always had the philosophy. If we pay for the pizza, then all the neighborhood kids will be at our house instead of in the crack house across the street. So that's a hashtag you know, right you there. Just, <laughs> pay for you the just, pizza. <laughs> you pay for the pizza. Yeah. So so you know you you want them where you can see them and you know what's going on. And um, and uh, people on the internet uh, know me as the guy that wrote the book on Google advertising, and that actually goes back to. When I was an engineer uh, designing speakers, um, I, I was an acoustical engineer and I got laid off and my wife mm. was three months pregnant with our first child. And um, I could not find a suitable engineering job in without moving away. I could move and I didn't want to. It's like <laughs> sometimes you just don't want to move across the country, you know. And so I ended up kind of having to go into sales. Mm. And I remember my friend Frank said, you know, Perry, you know, you don't just stick a pencil behind your ear. And, you know, and, and I was like, ah, oh, okay, you know, I don't know. I don't really think those guys are all that smart. Like, this shouldn't be <laughs> yeah, too Yeah, just hard. become a salesperson. All right. Uh, that's great. <laughs> you guys are obviously catching the drift. So... I don't know. Would it surprise you that I spent the next two years bologna sandwiches, ramen soup, 
Um, oh, baked potatoes and salsa. That's another cheap kind of food. You can buy <laughs> a 10 I'm going to die right now, potatoes. so potatoes sound amazing <laughs> with anything on them. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> and um, and so I was kind of thrown in the lake, and I had to swim, and I didn't swim very well. Um, I kind of, like, I tried really hard, and they knew I was trying, and they were really nice people. But, you know, there was just multiple things that just weren't quite right. And every, t- every one of these big deals that I would work on, it would look really appetizing, and it would just get yanked right out from under me, something would cave in, some manufacturer wouldn't be able to deliver the goods or what have you. And so finally, at the end of two years, they just shot me in the head and put me out of my misery. (laughs) And um, I remember going to work and I, I get out of my blue 1985 Toyota Corolla, which is rusty on the fenders. And I... I have my chicken fettuccine like TV dinner thing in my hand and I I walk through the office and Wally goes, Hey Perry, could I talk to you for a minute? And like I just this is not gonna be a good conversation. <laughs> and it was a really short conversation. He's like, you know, dude, we're done. And, and so I, you know, he fired me and I took my chicken fettuccine, I took it back to my car and I drove an hour back home. So two, you know, an hour to get there, get fired an hour back. And I walk in the door uh, at brutal. nine o'clock in the morning and my wife looks up and she goes, you got fired, didn't you? <laughs> oh, the question is, was the fettuccine still good after yeah. the two hour car ride or? I, I, I ate it for lunch. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. So like, yeah. So I, I know about failure. I'm intimately familiar. Failure and I have had a long and drawn out courtship <laughs> over many years. Um, <laughs> and, and so, uh, I took, I took a job at this new company and, Man, I I was really lucky because so this was like the week before Thanksgiving and I had interviewed at this company and then I got fired. Then the company made me a job offer. Then I started the new job and the the new company never found out I got fired from the old job. Okay. And I was just like paddling like a duck, you know, like <laughs> Is this another sales? This is another sales job or Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and it was it was a sales and marketing job and it, in many ways it was similar, but there were a couple things that were different. Hmm. By the way, this is 1997. Okay. So, you know, I got like a a year and a half old baby girl. Um our debt has just spiraled out of control. And, um, you know, and I get, I get this new job and they had a website. Mm. And now at that time, like most people weren't really using the web all that much. They were talking about it, but you know, it wasn't all. And, and believe me, there weren't a lot of people buying stuff on the internet in 97. Yeah. You know, maybe a few books on Amazon, but not like nothing, nothing like now. Well, eBay had just launched, right? Yeah, eBay was starting to come along. Well, this company sold to engineers, and engineers were ahead of the curve on the Internet. And what was already happening was most engineers would do research online before they would call anybody Mm -hmm. or talk to anybody. And so um, and about six months before that, before I got fired, I had wandered into the Peoria, Illinois Civic Center where Zig Ziglar and Barbara Bush and like all these motivation, like uh, Jim Rohn, like all these Mm -hmm. motivational sales speaker guys are all doing their dog and pony show, you Mm -hmm. know? And because I always went to stuff like that. I've been a personal development junkie, well, ever since I was in Amway, which is like a whole nother topic well um and and the last person was dan kennedy and dan is this grizzled direct marketing guy 
and he was selling this magnetic marketing kit, and it was basically direct marketing 101 in 1997, which is print ads and direct mail, essentially, yeah. is what it was. And, and the pitch was, hey, cold calling is the worst form of grunt work devised by man, <laughs> Okay, it's like it's like digging ditches or smearing tar on hot roads in the summer. <laughs> like, like the worst, you know, worst thing ever devised in, in this cruel world. And you shouldn't do it. And you should do low cost lead generation marketing and advertising instead. And, you know, you shouldn't be pounding on doors like the customers should be seeking you out. And man, that sounded delicious. And though he levitated $287 out of my wallet and I went home with this thing and, and, and I started seriously studying it. And like, I knew like my time was running out. I got to find a better job. I got to find a way to make this job work or something uh, because this is not working and we're going deeper in debt. I, I remember I even went, I, I went to a local community college and I applied to be an instructor and work in the evening so I'd have two jobs so that we wouldn't like go bankrupt. Yeah. And I knew that I would never see my wife, I would never see my kid, but it's better than being homeless mm. or having to move into your parents' house back <laughs> in Nebraska, you know. And- I choose homeless, I think. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so this is, this is where I was at. Well... All right, so we got this website, and they're actually willing to try stuff. And it, it occurs to me as I'm reading all this direct marketing stuff, like, hey, a web page and a direct mail piece are, like, the same thing. Yeah. Like, there isn't really any difference. It's just, oh, okay. And so then you generate a lead, like you offer something like a report or a white paper or a cheat sheet or a guide or something in exchange for people's email address, you know, and then you have permission to talk to them. And so we started doing lead generation and permission marketing in 1997, 98. Well, to make a long story short, um, the part of the business they put me in charge of grew 2000% in the next four years. And we sold the company for $18 million. Mm. And I got stock options. So I got, I got it you know, some cash out of the deal and I parachuted out and, and hung out my shingle. Mm. And um and my life really in the space of about six months went from like this miserable desperation of opening a manufacturer's directory when I would get to work every morning and trying to find people that definitely did not want to talk to me and, and <laughs> all this stuff to okay Hey, you know, I uh, came in this morning and last night we got five new sales leads that are in the email box and uh, another sales lead got faxed in from some magazine or something. And I love that feeling. All these guys, like they've got these engineering problems and they want to figure out how to solve them. And there's not very many companies that do this. And and like somebody actually wants to talk to me and I'm not a pariah and I don't have leprosy. (laughs) Oh my word. Like this is amazing. (laughs) So that's, that's kind of how my life got turned around. That's amazing. That is amazing. So then talk to us, you know, obviously you've written this book, you know, this 80, 20 rule concept that you really kind of took and ran with and, and almost made like a mantra of your your business and, and in a way your life. Um, could you tell us a little bit about what this 80-20 rule is and what it's all about in your mind and how you think it applies to business? So when I had the sales manager job that I was just referring to, the one that was working, I was reading some marketing book and it said hey, there's this thing called the 80-20 rule, and it says that 80% of your orders come from 20% of your customers, and the other 20% of your orders comes from 80% of your customers. And I thought, hmm, is that true? And I remember printing out a QuickBooks report of all our customers and going through it. I was like, I'll be darned when I, like, I print them out from top to bottom, and when I get 20% through the list, that's 80% of the money. Like, Mm. Wow, that's interesting. 
well, okay, but that's, th- I, I thought that's all there was. And this is what most people think. Like, wow, okay, yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. What do I do um, with it? And, right. you know, most people have heard it in economics, too. Like, okay, 20% of the people have 80% of the money and vice versa. And so, okay, so the world is unequal. But that was it. Mm-hmm. Okay, I didn't get it. I really didn't get it. So, so let me, there's two things that if you know these two things, this becomes like an endless rabbit hole <laughs> that you can go down. Okay. It's here are the two things. 80, 20 isn't just this business rule of thumb. It's a universal law of cause and effect. And it's almost everywhere. Mm -hmm. It's the size of craters on the moon. It's rabbit populations. It's uh, 80% of the dirt on your rug in your living room is on 20% of the rug. Because, (laughs) okay, and and 80% of your family's time is spent in 20% of the rooms in your house. And almost any spreadsheet in your business about anything Mm. No way. That's 80, crazy. Per, 80% of the stuff is in the top 20% of the spreadsheet if you sort by that column. And it's everywhere. So it's in economics, it's in psychology, it's in physics, it's in chemistry, it's huh. in business, it's in marketing, it's in, it's in Google accounts, it's in Facebook, it, it's everywhere. Okay? Yeah. Now, that's, the fir- that's only the first part. Okay? Now, you could, like, you could spend the whole rest of your life just working on the first part. But here's the second part. The second part, it's, this might be a new word for some people. It's fractal. Mm -hmm. What does fractal mean? Fractal means pattern inside a pattern inside a pattern inside a pattern inside a pattern that could go on infinitely. Okay? And in 80-20, here's what it means. 20% of the people have 80% of the money, but 20% of the of those 20% have 80% of that 80%. Mm-hmm. And 20 of the 20 of the 20 have 80 of the 80 <laughs> of the 80. That's great. And 20 of the 20, so it's like it's like one of those little Fibonacci spirals that right. just goes on and on, all right? So so if you actually do the numbers of 8020 and there's there's a tool that comes with uh, my my book that lets you plug this in you can actually figure out oh yeah okay so there's 8 billion people in the world and 1.6 billion people actually do have 80% of the money and you could work it all the way up to Jeff Bezos hmm. and it will tell you that the number one person is going to have a trillion dollars <laughs> it's like a law of physics. That's crazy. And it is totally crazy. And I'm telling you, this really is a rabbit hole that you could spend weeks, months, or years going down because, like, okay, each of you guys has a computer. If we if we take any of your business spreadsheets, yeah. Okay. It could be it could be the different SKU items, products that sold in a store. It could be the various customers. It could be the investors in a real estate deal. Yeah. It could be apartments, rentals, landlords, apartment management companies, mileage on cars, whatever. Almost all of it is 80-20. And so what it means is that there's these tiny little levers that swing huge outcomes, tiny little hinges that swing big doors. And basically, the job of any business manager, any business strategist, any salesperson is to go, okay, so where is the 1% of the inputs that controls 50% of the outputs? And you will find it over and over and over and over again. Mm -hmm. So you have a Google Ads account and you're buying clicks to go to your website, 80% of the clicks are in 20% of the ads in ad campaigns. Mm -hmm. And uh, so insurance, 80% of your insurance premiums are paid by 20% of the customers and 
50% of the insurance premiums are paid by 1% of the customers. And you, you can go to things like customer service problems and product defects. You can get rid of huge problems by firing one employee or one customer or one vendor. Interesting. And so, yeah. Have you found in your have you found in obviously your business Perry as you've grown your own business and then obviously you can do consulting with uh, with tons of different clients like how does one tangibly like if you were consulting Josh and I right now with Reminder Media like what would be your process to help us implement this 80/20 rule or you know take a real estate agent or insurance agent like what's the process you go through to help someone apply the principle like practically in their day to day Okay so there's in any business or any part of a business, right? Like we could we could take your whole business or we could just chunk it down to, you know, uh, a product line, let's say. There is a, so there is a top 20% of good things, profitable things, and there is a top 20% of losses and problems. Okay, so so here's an example. Um, there's this really clever thing called the 2120 rule that my friend Lynn Bertain came up with. And so track with me here. 20% of your customers or investments, like apartment buildings or like whatever, 20% of your product or customers produces 120% of your profits. 20 let's say what you made last what you made last year. Like okay. whatever you made last year. 20% of your customers made you 120% of what you made last year and the bottom 20% lost money which got you down to 100. Meaning you're spending more than you're making on those. Interesting. On right. on on it, and it might, might be 20% of your customers. It might be 5% of your customers. But if you, if you rank your customers in profitability from top to bottom, I guarantee you that you have customers you lose money on. Right. Oh, yes. And if yeah. you just got rid of them. Right. And did nothing else. Right. You would make more money with less work. What if the, I love the sound of that. <laughs> what if the, what if the, principle though continue to apply i mean once you lose that bottom 20 percent or whatever it is then doesn't yep. it just reset like how well, do you, yes it does how do you capitalize and, on it to turn it into a surplus i guess okay so let, let's get let's take an example with salespeople. okay so if you hire 10 salespeople next week 80 20 guarantees you that two of them will sell more than the other eight put together. Okay. In fact, they'll sell quite a bit more than the other eight. I mean, we see that on our sales true? floor. Yeah, we, we <laughs> see that to be true on our sales floor. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Got that. Guaranteed to be true. Now, here's what most people do. <clears throat> Most people nurse the runts. It's kind of like when I was a kid. <laughs> That's another hashtag. Now, yeah. Don't nurse the runts. <laughs> we, 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 had, we had a cat who got hit by a car, and she had all these kittens. And the next day, my mom's got milk in a doll bottle. And she's like feeding the kittens. Yeah. Okay, now yeah. that's a good that's a good thing to do with kittens. Right, that's right. a bad thing to do with bad salespeople. Okay, mm. Preach so it. here's yep. here's what you do: you fire anywhere from two to eight of your ten salespeople, depending on how Darwinian you're willing to be. Yeah. Okay, yeah, and and then you take the money and the time and the effort that you would have spent nursing the runts along, and you lavish the good ones with every possible convenience that makes their job simpler, easier, faster. It's like, oh, Got it. we hired Betty, and she's going to take your shoebox right and receipts, there, right. and she's going to do your expense reports, and she's going to book your travel, and we're going to get you a chauffeur, and and we're and we're get, we're going to get you a sales assistant who's going to. She's going to deal with all your manuals and your quotes and everything. And, and we're going to get you a personal assistant to help you with your emails. We're just going to make sure that you are the closing machine and that you're in there with all the deals, right? Because 
you could you could sell way more with three great salespeople than you ever could with thirty, you know, blind, right. lame, crippled. <laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome. I I see that. I I've seen that in my sales career. I mean, you have your top reps, as you call them. You know, depending on how many you have, that are generating a majority of the sales. We call them the pace mm-hmm. horses, but they're yeah. the majority of the sales. You know, I see that. That I, I would see that as a huge practical application. Ranking your reps, ranking everything, I think is the difficult part. Is it hard for people? Is that what you find when you're consulting for for them to pull the numbers together to to measure things? Like, um, I, well, if, if you're if you're gonna like do this thoroughly, yes, that is that is difficult. However, on the first pass. Usually everybody knows, and they're just not r- ready to admit to themselves. So, so for example, I gave a keynote speech to a whole room full of certified public public accountants uh, a few years ago, and I said, I said, how many of you? So you're all doing tax preparation and all that kind of stuff. So how many of you? You've got that client, and they're always really disorganized, and they're only paying you like three hundred and fifty dollars. And like it's 18 phone calls and 147 emails. And like, you know that you're not making money on these people. And they're just, you don't know what to do with them. How many, and like all these hands go up. I said, okay, I, Perry Marshall, best-selling author, I bequeath you permission to fire the clients. I said, yeah, you don't have to be mean about it. Okay, but you just send them a letter and you can say, hi, my partners and I were discussing all of our accounts and our strategy for next year. And unfortunately, we just won't be able to service your account in 2019. And we will be happy to refer you to another firm and we'll bundle all your stuff together and we'll ship it off to whoever needs it. And thank you so much for being a wonderful customer. Here's a cupcake and, you know, we love you and Barney and everything, but we just... <laughs> We can't help you anymore. That is a and golden nugget right there. Firing firing difficult clients is uh, so hard to do in this life, but it is a golden nugget, and, and really good business owners know that. Just about everybody should be firing 3 to 5% of their customers. Like, mm-hmm. really? And most, if, if most people that have a big product line, they should be discontinuing 3 to 5% of their products, yeah. if not 10 there's okay, a company no, you're losing yet. you're taping dollar bills to everyone that goes out come on like and now you might have to do some serious cost accounting to figure that one out right okay but dude defense like and you know one of the things i've learned is good offense does not make up for no defense hmm true in football Definitely. true in basketball right Hey man, like you got to keep the money that you made show up, right? So, okay, you're a sales guy, you're a marketing guy, just like me, and like we shouldn't be running the finance department. I totally own that. <laughs> but like you, you got to, you got to have guys that like know how much stuff costs and how many hours are going into things. Like, and you got to pay attention because, like, most people think that most businesses are fairly optimized and most industries are fairly advanced. Like, no, actually just about everybody is just peeing away money left oh, and right. Oh man, there's so much know waste. It. I know there's so much waste. Yeah. I mean, it's so crazy. You take, I mean, you, you, you've got the, you've got the five, 10, 20%, whatever of the clients at the bottom that you're willing to let go because you know that they're costing you money. They're not seeing the full potential. How do you then identify, how do you go out, and get more top 20%. Like what's the process for finding that, whether you're talking well, about finding new clients or whatever that might be? Well, so let's talk about where there's some hidden money in almost every business. So the good news is many times you don't even have to find new clients. So 80-20 says that 1% of your customers want to give you half of that money. Half of the money. Oh, the, all the money. <laughs> okay. So, like, do 80-20 backwards. Like, okay, 80-20 okay, says that 
1% of these customers want to give us half the money. Hmm. Okay, so so I call this the Starbucks principle of the $2,700 espresso machine. Hmm. So, so 8020 says that if I have a thousand people a, a week buying five dollar lattes at Starbucks, which is five thousand bucks, right? Twenty percent of those people want to spend four times the money, okay. and twenty percent of those people want to spend four times the money, gotcha. and twenty percent of those people want to spend four times the money. So if if you do the numbers, so you got to one person who wants to spend twenty five hundred. Yeah, you you will have for for every thousand people that buy. A thousand lattes. One person will spend twenty seven hundred dollars on a gleaming stainless steel espresso hmm. machine, and they will go. They will take. They'll 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 whack their credit card. They'll take the thing home. They'll put it on their counter, and you know what? They will come back tomorrow morning and they'll buy another latte. So, what are some practical things you can do in your business? I mean, we a lot of our listeners are, are service based sales professionals. We talked about that: real estate, financial advisor, insurance. What are some things you can do to identify? that one percent okay so what what you do is you look at the top 20 percent of your customers the top five percent of your customers and you say if okay so let's say i'm an insurance agency and i've got a, a whole bunch of clients that are giving me ten thousand dollars a month yep well for for every for every five that are giving you ten thousand dollars a month, one could be giving you forty. Okay. Okay. Yep. Look, so where is the forty? And you think, okay, I need an espresso machine. Gotcha. Now this is like a law of physics. The money is in their pockets. They're going to spend it somewhere. It's burning a hole in their. Who's pocket. got my money? <laughs> right. <laughs> you Who's go got my it. money? <laughs> so so you go you go you go. Well, we don't have a ten thousand dollar. We don't have a forty thousand dollar a month insurance package. Like, well, make one. <laughs> okay, like, Amen. like and, and and I don't mean just make stuff up, but but no, but I like, get what you're saying. You know, like like maybe well, they take need the effort that you would be concierge level, right? right? Take the effort you'd be spending on that lower twenty percent that you just got rid of and use it to innovate, build something new to find that right. hidden money. Yeah. Right. So think espresso machine. It's like, okay, what would be a super deluxe served up on a silver platter? Um, you know, nobody else really does it this way. What would be super, you know, maybe, maybe it's somebody drives to their office and they do something like every single day, or maybe mm -hmm. like, I don't know, but like, what's like four times the service, four times the attention, four times the value. It's there. Yeah. And it, it it, it just it literally goes up and up and, until you're at your last customer and they're giving you like every dime they possibly can. <laughs> Dude, I love it. It's like I'm sitting here. My brain is going, going, <laughs> you know, so often we're, we're thinking externally and we are going after trying to find new clients, new deals, new things. And we we lack to look internally and realize there's so much hidden money within our business and hidden money within our clients. And Josh and I always have a saying that everything you need for your next deal is in the current deal you just closed. Meaning like we believe in working and growing your business off of referrals, growing your business off of the relationships you have. So Perry, let me ask you this. Is there a routine that you do in your life every single day that has driven success for you? Um, you know, everybody's looking for the magic formula of success. Is there like a routine that you do that has driven both success personally and professionally in your life? Yes. Um, every day, I'm going now five and a half years without missing a day. I start my day not on a phone, not on a tablet, not in my email box, not with a device. I get my cup of tea and a notebook, like pen and a blank sheet of paper. I pray, meditate, and journal. And that's how that's how I start my day. Five years. Every wow. day. Wow. Okay. That is the best personal habit that I've cultivated. Hmm. Um, it's like oxygen. Um, I think most people have no idea how cluttered their brain is 
and how unable they are to think clearly. You know, you cannot think your own thoughts and somebody else's thoughts at the same time. <laughs> that's powerful. Okay. I bet that's awesome to go back and read as well. You know, uh, read it, what you it, it is five years and, ago. And let, let me t- let me tell you a story about that. Um, so I I I had forgotten about this until a few months ago. I was going back through an old journal in 2013. Now. One of the things that I do with my blank sheet of paper and my pen is I pray and I ask questions. So in the 80-20 book, you'll read a story at the end about how I came up with this different math formula of how to do 80-20. Okay. Okay. And, um, and so I use it to run the software in the 80-20 Curve website, but I never published it anywhere. And I asked the question... Where should I publish the 80-20 formula? And I'll ask a question and I just listen. Like the first thing that comes back, I will take that as an answer. And the answer came back, publish in Harvard Business Review or similar. Okay, and I wrote it down. Now, I have no access to Harvard Business Review (laughs) whatsoever. Okay, now... I've sold hundreds of thousands of books. I'm a famous author and all that. But the online marketing entrepreneur renegades in the Harvard Business Review MBA (laughs) guys are as different different as could possibly be. Right. So I've no reach into that world. Um, Well, a year and a half ago, this company in Italy wants me to come speak. And so we booked the speaking gig in and then I get this email from them a few months later, and they go, um, we are featuring our speakers in Harvard Business Review Italy. Would you like to write an article? And I'm like, <laughs> uh, yeah, I would like to write an article for Harvard Business Review Italy. That would be fine. The home of Vilfredo <laughs> Pareto, by the way, the guy. That yeah, the full team. circle. <laughs> and and so and and, uh, and so I published my math formula in Harvard Business Review, and then like six months later, I'm going through this old journal and I find this. Wow! Like I kind of remember yeah, it. That's but awesome. It like, it's the power I mean, of visualization. This, okay, I'm telling you, in in it, uh, it, it was like uh, so. I call that an answered prayer. I mean, but it was like I asked a question. <laughs> You know, and I got an answer, and then like the thing materializes later. That's awesome. Um, this is the sort of thing that happens when I start my day in a meditative yeah. frame of mind, rather than a okay, all right, go, go get the eggs, reactive. get the coffee, yeah. got to run. That's great. The way I start right? my day, very reactive. <laughs> That's yeah. awesome. So, well, going back now, Perry. You know, the last question for you um, is. You know, what would you go back and tell your younger self? We always like asking the people we interview, you know, knowing what you know now, what would you go back and tell younger Perry? Um, I have seen a pattern looking back that I have many, many times had a tendency to hang on to things after I knew they weren't working. Mm. Just out of inability to emotionally disengage. Nostalgic, yep. Okay, and like... Le- like when you figure out that s- something is not the thing, it's not working, it's not successful. Mm, that's a goal. You make nugget. a clean break and you embrace the future. Okay. Um, I I hung on to my Amway thing way too long. Uh, that would be an example. Um, there's there's all kinds of things where like I was. I was wishy-washy about, like, ambivalent, and I shouldn't have been. Like, Mm. there was no reason. And so I guess I would just say to the listeners, is there something that you know isn't working that you need to just cut it off, Mm. be done with it, and move on? And listen, 80-20 is first and foremost, it's about what you ignore, and what you eliminate and right. what you who you fire and what customer you no longer want and what product you cancel it's about saying no first 
And most of us have a very hard time saying no. Yeah, that, that was that was man. The whole interview was worth that answer right there. That is a huge truth right there. If you guys rewind that, listen to that again. I mean, that is a huge truth to apply to your life, which is so difficult for so many. Well, and the practical part there is the eighty twenty rule kind of gives you removes the emotion. You yes. know, if you're willing to go through the steps to <laughs> it's get not to elimination, get to baby. Yeah. I love that. Well, thank you so much for being here, Perry. I, man, I feel like we could have gotten into. We didn't get to Facebook ads. We didn't get to Google. We'll ads, have to have you back, man. We'll have to have you back on. Dig into that a little bit more. Uh, uh, before be we do close out there, let people know where they can connect with you, where they can get your book, anything that you want to plug there. But you can get 80, 20 sales and marketing for a penny plus shipping plus extra videos at 80, 20, uh, uh, sorry, sell 80, 20.com S C L L eight zero two zero.com. Um, we sell it on our website. And if, if you buy it there, you'll be privy to a sales sequence. that has been very methodically and carefully orchestrated and you'll learn a lot just watching. How do I sell? How do I communicate with my audience? How do I do emails? You can study the emails and That's learn awesome. how to communicate. So sell8020.com. Awesome. Also, I mean, as you're going through that, and I'm just going to, we're always looking at things from a marketing perspective and our listeners should be as well. As you're going through the process of getting that book, watch what Perry does from a sales funnel standpoint as well, because you can take these ideas, apply them to your business. It's super powerful stuff there. Get into that mindset of being a marketer, being a salesperson online. Thank you so much for listening. If you like what you heard here today on Stay Paid, please go on iTunes, give us a five-star rating and make sure to leave a comment. You can also find our podcast in video on youtube.com slash reminder media. Make sure to tell someone else about the podcast today. It really helps us spread the word. And if you'd like to get hold of me or Luke, please email us at podcast at remindermedia.com or you can find us on Instagram or on, and or and or slash and or. Lord LinkedIn. <laughs> Anything. Just Google as you'll find it. For this episode of Stay Paid, I am Joshua Stike. And I'm Luke Acre, guys. And I think the action item is a really, really simple one on you know this episode is applying that 80-20 rule to your lead generation categories. Take the time this week to you know look at all the leads that have come in in your business, whether you're a real estate agent, insurance agent, financial advisor, where are the leads coming from? And look and apply the 80-20 rule going, is that, help, is that happening where 80% of your leads are coming from three of your campaigns or 20% of your campaigns? And at that point, double down on those campaigns. So take that, apply it to your business from a lead generation standpoint and see what comes out of that. Take action on that because remember the difference between a top producer and a mediocre producer in any industry is top producers take action. So take action on that today. 